want the American dream. I want to be happy. The professor said to me, you can never measure happiness. Now why they thought you could measure depression, which they were all doing, but you couldn't measure happiness, I'm not sure. to me. That's why I love it so much. And then you don't know what you're going to see. When I was run over by a truck, my whole life changed. There is a great deal you can do on a regular basis to become happy. So, just as a primer, and I'd also like now to do a, just a little survey. Um, I'm going to ask two questions. Um, the first question, I want a spontaneous answer. If you agree with me, just put up your hand. Uh, and the second question, I'd like to think a little bit, ponder a little bit more for maybe 10 seconds. So, the first question is, are you feeling happy today? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that, that's good. <laughs> the second question is, just to ponder a little bit more, and I want to ask you, are you a happy person? Just think about that for 10 minutes, 10 seconds, not 10 minutes. Um, so if you can give me your answer. Are you a happy person? No, yeah, not quite as, as many, but the point I'm trying to make here is that happiness is, can be very transient. And the challenge is to go from that transient happiness to a continuous happiness. And uh, my talk today was given to me by Susanna, of course. And I'm, I'm appreciate it because some of our last talks have been suicides and obsessors. <laughs> so it's nice to have a subject like this. But what she was trying to go towards was uh, the, 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 the material that's given in Heaven and Hell. And uh, particularly in the last part of Heaven and Hell, there's a lot of communications with many spirits from all different levels. But today I'm going to focus on the happy spirits. These five happy fellows actually accompany me through this process this week and they, they follow me around the screen but don't get too distracted with them. <laughs> so the way I've, I've structured the talk today is in four parts. And the first part, uh, I'm going to talk about happiness in the world we're living now. And I think it's important because if we to understand how we can project our happiness in the future life, we need really to have a, a better feeling of what happiness is now. Um, so I'm going to go through a definition of happiness and talk about current understanding. And by current understanding, I really mean the neuroscience. There's been a huge advance. In fact, as the, the doctor in, the, in this, the short trailer has mentioned, we knew a lot about anxiety and stress and depression. But only the last 20, 25 years, we've really started to investigate um, the aspects of happiness and well-being uh, as it relates to the brain. And one of the tools that's been used is uh, functional pneumatic, uh, nu nuclear magnetic resonance, MNR which gives real insight to the brain and which aspects of the brain and places in the brain are activated through our emotions. And then through that we can get some insights into what can really make us happier. And not just happy in the moment, but happy on a continuous basis. And the tools that can help us get there. The second part of my talk is really looking at the spiritist literature, going through what the literature tells us about uh, happiness in the corporeal world, and these are some of the resources I'm going to use. And then the third part, I'm going to go into heaven and hell with an overview. Um, heaven and hell is in two parts. The first part is the doctrine, and perhaps that first part is the most philosophical part of the whole of Kadek's work, I find it anyway. And, uh, but he, he treats it in a very rational and logical way, and it's very, very readable and very understandable. So I'm going to briefly talk about that. Uh, and then go into the second part, I say, which is um, the communications with spirits. He, he transitions the two parts by a, a, a short passage about the, uh, the passage. The passage, the transition from the uh, corporal life we're in now to the incorporeal life, in life. And I'm going to pick on one of the spirits, uh, Mr. Sanson. It's the largest uh, evocation that he did in, this, in all the spirits. I'm just going to focus on that as an example. Rather than trying to summarize all the different, I think there's about 18 spirits who give the communication. They all have different aspects and they all have different attributes. But I think uh, Mr. Samson is better for us to focus on one, one only, and get to understand Mr. Samson. So, starting off, let's look at the, the definition of happiness. And the Webster's Dictionary gives it in two stages. A pleasure, pleasurable or satisfying experience, and a state of well-being and contentment, joy. 
And I think we've all recognized it. We have a lot of pleasurable experiences. And uh, it brings to mind a, a, a phrase my father always used to say to me about, about pleasure. He says, when a pleasure becomes a habit, it ceases to become a pleasure. And I think that gives an idea that we, what we've got to try and do is get away from those individual moments of pleasure where our senses or our feelings uh, go to us and give us a high, but we have to try and drive that into a longer term. And, and the second part of the definition, the state of well-being, I think, is giving us that point of view, that longer term point of view. Um, in, in the opening uh, trailer, you know, the question was asked, what is the purpose of life? And one of them said, American dream. And it brought up this of the, my memory of the Declaration of Independence, even though I was born in Britain, but uh, I'm now dual nationality, so I can accept it a lot more. But it's an amazing document. And key in that document is this phrase, that we're all created uh, equal, and uh, we have these rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think the, the forefathers were very insightful they didn't say life, liberty, and happiness. They said no, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and this word pursuit indicates the journey that's important, not the destination, but the journey, and that we're going to develop more. So taking the state of well-being and looking at the definition of well-being, this is what the dictionary tells us. It's a state of being happy, healthy, or prosperous. So it's happy in both body and healthy in mind, happy and healthy in, in mind and body, and it mentions prosperous, because I think we all recognize, um, if, again, if you go back to the trailer, what is the purpose of life? Be you happy? Well, how can you get happy? What's the first thing that comes into mind? Ask that question. Anybody? What's the, what's the next thing you think of when you say, you know, what's the purpose of life? I want to be happy. How are you going to get there? Money, right? Money. Everybody, no, that's true. Everybody feels money is one of the sources of happiness. And, you know, that's the material life we live in. But a lot of work has been done about the aspects of wealth and happiness. And yes, of course, if we're living in a very uh, limited resources, we need, we need clothing, we need a roof over our heads, we need food. Um, but when that amount of resources increases, life becomes better. We can buy uh, other more comfortable surroundings. We can start to spend money on books and get educated and so on. And our happiness level definitely increases with money. But it does get to a point, and this has been proven over and over again, that more and more money, in fact, creates just the opposite effect. So that, that curve changes. Um, hence the prosperity side of the, the equation. So I'd like to share with you um, some work by Richard Davison. Richie likes to be called. And he's perhaps one of the lead uh, researchers, neuroscientists, been working on this field for 40 years. An amazing character, and um, in fact, the United Nations now publish an index every five years, a happiness index of all the countries in the world. It was started in, of all places, in Nepal. Instead of me measuring GDP, it started to measure happiness of the population, being a better indicator of how people were living. And the United Nations took that up, and in fact, uh, Richard Davison is one of the advisors. It used to be just economists, but now he's part of that group. What I particularly find uh, interesting about Richie is that he's been very spiritual from back before he even got his doctorate. He spent three months in India and Sri Lanka and started, uh, because he had a, a real interest in the spiritual and particularly meditation. And for the whole of this time he's been an active meditator. Every day he meditates. And as his work progresses in the field of neurology and neuroscience, um, he got to know the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama in the early 90s challenged him, said, look, you've got all this technology, all this insight, why don't you study happiness? And he took him up on that challenge. And <laughs> with the help of some of the long-term practitioners, he started doing work on the brain in real time in NMR uh, surroundings. And again, trying to understand more of the functionality of the brain. And he, has, he came up with this major insight that our brain is plastic. And plastic means it can be rewired. We're all born with 100 trillion neur 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 neurons in our brain. And basically, they reach the peak when they're late teens. And after that, they probably die off. There's no, there are certain areas of the brain, apparently, that do uh, split and, and bring up new cells. 
But basically, that's what we've we given. But what we can do is the way we can rewire those brain cells and the interactions um, to help us uh, develop. And they, they, they change in terms of the experiences we have. And by extension, if we can give experiences that are healthy to the brain, we can develop new habits and, and, and elevate our level of happiness and well-being. Um, it seems that changes can be done subconsciously or consciously. That's the problem. We have a lot of subconscious things that we don't know about that drive us in a negative way. So we have to be cautious that we use these, this training to direct us in the right direction. And bottom line is the invitation is really to take responsibility for our brains, to do some mental housekeeping in there. And he talks about four constituents of well-being. And I think these are really insightful. The first one is resilience. Um, he defines resilience as the capacity to overcome adversity. So when something bad happens, we get over it quick. I mean, we've all gone through Irma, we've all suffered. But really, it is a, an ability that's wired into our brain that we can change. We can change. We can overcome that adversity quickly or less quickly. And that is a key element of our well-being. It talks about positive outlook. And here I'm talking about respect to other people. Always look at the smile that Sandra's giving me now, or a good thing that other people are doing. Don't look at the bad side. Always have this interaction with the, your neighbors, your friends. And this obviously parallels what we, we learn in spiritism. Um, the third aspect is attention. Um, he, he cites not his experiment, but his experiment done, a very simple experiment a few years ago, whereby um, a phone app was developed. Okay? and recruited uh, thousands of people who agreed to, over a period of time, receive a random text during the day. And they had to answer, one, what they were doing at that moment they got the text. And there was a, a list of, you know, just tick off the item or write something else in there. Secondly, is your attention on what you're doing at the moment? And thirdly, are you feeling happy now? And there was a scale, one to 10, that was sort of uh, rehearsed beforehand. So after all these people and all this data was crunched, uh, the study came to the, the conclusion that more than almost 50% of the time we're not focused on what we're doing. And everyone, we can do a lot better, okay? And the other factor is that when we are focused, we're happier. We're happier. I mean, when you see people in the zone, see uh, Rafael Nadal winning the US Open, uh, last night we went to a concert at the New World Symphony and the conductor there was totally in the zone with his 70 piece orchestra playing Tchaikovsky. I mean, that's the zone and that's what helps us uh, be more happy now that our state of well-being. And last but last not least is generosity. And this, he's using this word as an umbrella, but it includes compassion, kindness, um, altruism, particularly altruism, helping others not just when you feel they need it, but going out of your way to help others. And it's a triple winner. When you help somebody else, you help that person. That person is more likely to pass it on to help somebody else. But the third aspect of altruism, generosity, is that we elevate ourselves. And it is an extended, it's not a momentary peak in our, our well-being. It's something that, that has a, a lasting effect. OK, so that's a bit about contemporary um, understanding. And again, if you want to go into this in more detail, I do recommend it. There's some incredible material out there. Um, so now I want to go into the, now I want to have a drink, actually, because I always have this mind over body situation when I do a talk. <laughs> I get nervous, my stomach tightens up, I go faster. So tell me to slow down, OK? Um, so I want to go into the, the spiritist literature, and particularly the codification books. Um, I've been studying now for about six years. And the more I study, the more amazed I am at the, the content. When you reread, you see things in a different light. Um, and also, I think the way that the books are structured, the way they integrate with each other. And I want to talk a little bit about that before I get into heaven and hell. So as we know, the, the spirit books is in four parts. First course is about basically God. It's asked about what is God. Uh, and talks about the origin of the, the universe, the world, um, and so on. And, and talks also about vital principle. And we're going to explore this a bit more in, in a later stage in the talk. The second part is the, the spirit world, or the world of spirits. Um, I can just imagine 
uh, the ridicule that Kardec must have experienced when 150 years ago he talks about this world we're surrounded by spirits. I mean, even the, you know, today we have difficulties in comprehending that because we haven't got that, that tangible uh, evidence that there is this world of spirits out there. Um, I, I'm often asked, you know, has, you've changed since you've been studying spirits, and what is it? When you get onto that bit about how about we're all surrounded by spirits, it's a little bit diff more difficult. But I see, and I'm a basically came from a scientific background, and I'm very much agnostic, I should say, prior to getting into spiritism. Um, there is incredible amount of evidence on there, um, out there, and again, there's many good talks in the spiritist literature that goes that into more details. But also in the spirit world, he talks about the spirit, the soul, and the perispirit. And for those who are not quite so familiar, there is a difference between the soul and the spirit. We tend to use those words interchangeably. But, but the soul is our essence, okay? The perispirit is that non-material body that encapsulated the, the soul. So the perispirit with the soul becomes a spirit. And when that perispirit incorporates with material body, as we are now, we now incarnate spirits, okay? And, and that is important to reflect on because we'll come into that when we talk about the transitioning into the spirit world. And then the moral laws, which we know about very much, and hopes and consolations, which is uh, the precursor to heaven and hell. So, spirit world, he puts his second book out, which is the medium's book. It goes into a lot more details. And these two books really are, I, I consider these the technical manual. This is the, the basic technicalities of, you know, the science, the philosophy, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the science, philosophy, and the, uh, remember that religious side of spiritism. But the next two books, the gospel and uh, heaven and hell, are really the user's manual. This is, tells us how to apply it. And this is what's so important. And finally, of course, he goes back to the first causes and produces the, the book of Genesis, the last book of the codification. Um, we often think of the Genesis as a book of science, and it's not really, it's a book about the creator, uh, the grand designer, uh, organizing designer, as I like to call God. Um, so again, so that's the background. So where in this material can we find something that can help us understand a little bit more about achieving this level of well-being? And the first part is really, I find this in the law of preservation. Uh, question 720, towards what end has God made the enjoyment of material things attractive? Uh, it gives humans, uh, to drive humans to fulfill their missions and to test them with temptation. And they ask them, well, well, what, why, they, why use temptation? And the spirit sounds to develop their reason so they may learn to keep themselves from excesses. In the last part, which I say is a precursor to heaven and hell, can people enjoy complete happiness while on earth? Um, no, because life has been given to them either as a trial or expiation. It is up them to mitigate their misfortune and be happy as possible while on earth. So, we, you know, the Spirit tells us we, we should try to be happy. There's nothing wrong with being happy. But we have to set our horizons as to how we uh, arrive at that happiness. And the next question, can we understand that people will be happy on earth when humanity as a whole is transformed, but meanwhile, it, it possible for everyone uh, to enjoy relative happiness? And the spirits tell us most of the time people are the artisans of their own unhappiness. We create our unhappiness, okay? Um, if they would practice the law of God, they would spare themselves many misfortunes and enjoy a state of happiness that is great as their existence on such a dense planet will allow. So there is room there for us to be happy, and that's good news, I think that's good news. In the Gospel, according to Spiritism, uh, this is just a quote from one of the, the spirits that was channeled in that book after uh, Kardec talks about the, again, the, the, the Gospel is structured in phrases from the Bible and then looking at Kardec's comments on how that is from a Spiritist uh, optic and then finally uh, communications from spirits. And uh, the spirit, Maulo, he, say, he says that indeed neither wealth, power, not even the flower of youth are the essential conditions of happiness. Nevertheless, do not deduce that earth is dedicated forever to the fate of a penitentiary. Certainly not. From the progress already accomplished, you can easily infer future progress. And from social improvements that have been gained, new and more fertile improvements. So again, there's hope, okay? And just to continue in this, I, the book, 
Uh, Philosophy of Gratitude is an amazing book. Um, I'm sure, Sherry, you've read that many times. It's, it's an amazing book, and there's so much in there. But I'll just put out this one phrase. All who are grateful and truly understand the significance of real gratitude enjoy physical, emotional, and psychological health because they're content in living and sharing all things, and they're active participants in the social organization, creative and joyous. And finally, I'd just like to quote the last two phrases from the book of After Death by Leon Denis. He is perhaps one of the most uh, uh, eloquent writers of all the spirit in all the spiritual literature. In fact, when I went back to preparing this talk and I went back to this book, I ended up reading half the book again because it's just so beautiful and so much content in there. In fact, when I gave a talk on Leon Denis about 18 months ago, Heather was in the audience and she made a comment at the end that Leon Denise could pick up a telephone book and make it sound poetic. And the guy's just amazing. So these are just last two paragraphs of the book. So he ends the book by saying, Remember that life is short. During his course, endeavor to acquire all that have come to seek in the wor this world true improvement. May your spiritual being come out of it purer than upon entering it. Guard yourself against the traps of flesh. Keep in mind that the earth is a battlefield in which souls remain under the ceaseless assault of the matter and the senses. Fight vile passions bravely. Struggle by means of the spirit and the heart. Correct your flaws, soften your character, strengthen your will. May your mind detach itself from the, wildly, the worldly vulgarities and turn to the luminous sky. Remember that everything material is transient. This is what we've already talked about. The generations succeed one another like waves in the ocean. The empires fall. The worlds themselves perish. The suns extinguish themselves. Everything passes away. Everything fades. Nevertheless, there are three things that come from God, and they are immutable like Him. Three things that since that shine above the reflection of human glories, wisdom, virtue, and love. Put forth the effort to conquer all these three qualities, and upon obtaining them, you will feel you will rise above all that is temporary and transient, and enjoy all that is eternal. And of course, these three words. And these are the essence of our soul. We talk about our soul going from one life to the next one, to the spirit world and back. These are what we carry with us, wisdom, virtue, and love. And that's where our true happiness is, is, is found. Okay, so my happy spirits are getting a little happy because they're coming onto the part of the talk that uh, <laughs> refers to them. Um, the structure of, again, the, the, the heaven and hell is in two parts. And the first part is, again, as I mentioned, a very philosophical approach, but very readable, very rational. And he talks about the differences, goes into comparisons with basically what the Catholic Church says about this concept. And again, going back to my agnostic days, one of the reasons I could never accept religion was this whole concept of heaven or hell. You know, at the last minute you could be uh, given being free and you know, off you go to, to heaven. If you don't talk to the priest, then sorry guys, you're, you're down there. And it's something just did not resonate. Um, and he really explains this very carefully, very diligently, and very clearly. So in the second part of the book, we've um, got some more spirits growing us now, oh my goodness. Um, it basically, it's a communication of about over 60 spirits, and he, he groups them into these categories. And today we're going to focus on happy spirits, there's 18 of them, but I'm going to focus only on one today. All I'm going to try to do is whet your appetites, and I hope you'll Hopefully after this talk you'll be interested and you'll go and read more on your own. Um, so we're going to talk about one of those characters in the Happy Spirits. And we, before that, I'd like to just talk briefly about the passage. And the passage is this moment when we, we die and we leave, we're all going to die. <laughs> we know we're going to leave this corporal body. And there's two aspects to this I think that help us understand. First thing is I think we're all, even hardened spirits, spiritists that we are, we are um, we're all a bit apprehensive, right? Apprehensive. We don't know. It's unknown. Are we going to suffer? Um, but the mechanics of the separation, um, I just, just quickly summarize here, and it's to do with the, the perispirit, this uh, non material envelope that binds the soul with our material bodies. And the slower the disengagement of this perispirit from the body, the more it, the, the spirit suffers. Um, the speed of disengagement depends on the degree of moral development. So 
how we've uh, disassociated ourselves with those material pleasures and material things in life. But if we are dematerialized, in other words, we're preparing for our eventual departure, or I shouldn't say departure, we're, we're just changing address, okay? Um, death is only a temporary sleep, and there's no suffering. So with that in mind, we're going to talk about Mr. Sanson. Um, he's the first of the spirits, and uh, very little is given about his background, um, apart from when he was born, and he, was a, he had a lot of suffering in his last year, uh, and he was an active member of the Parisian uh, Spiritist Society. So I'm going to ask actually my good friend Helsil to help me in this endeavour. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, again, I tried different ways to, to bring this across, and uh, rather than just reading it to make it a little more dynamic, um, Helsil, as you probably know, like you all, he's a medium, but he's very articulate in, in channeling Alain Kardec. So he's going to take the part of Alain Kardec. Okay. Um, just before that, I just want to give an excerpt from the letter that uh, Mr. Samson wrote prior to his, um, his death. He says, please evoke my spirit as soon as possible and as often as is convenient to you, so that having been a sufficiently useless member of our society, so, so humble, huh, during my stay on earth, I may be at least of some use beyond the grave by providing you the means of studying, step by step, through evocation, the various circumstances resulting from what is commonly called death. You okay there? You want to come on this side? Or? No, just, you're you good here. Just move. Move, please. Move, please. Okay. <laughs> we'll do, I've got to respect Mr. Kardec, right? Yes. Kardec is watching you, Elsa. <laughs> and so are the happy spirits, I think. So, two days after his death, um, in order to satisfy, again, Mr. Samson's desire for an early evocation, a few men of the society went to the mortuary, the mortuary, standing next to his body, an hour before burial. Object was twofold, okay? One was to fulfill his last request, but the other was to try and observe the situation of soul immediately following the death. And the following communication was received. So I'm now Mr. Samson, okay? I'm answering your call in order to fulfill my promise. My dear Mr. Samson, we ourselves are fulfilling a duty and are pleased to be able to evoke you as soon as possible after your death, as was your desire. It is a special blessing of God to allow my spirit to communicate. I thank your goodwill, but I am weak and trembling. You had suffered so much, so I thought we might ask you how you feel now. Do you still feel your pain? What sensations are you experiencing in comparison with that of two days ago? My situation is quite happy, for I feel none of my former pain. I have recovered and I am renewed, as you used to say. My transition from earth to the spirit life might have been made, might have made everything incomprehensible at first, because we sometimes <laughs> remain many days without recu recovering our lucidity. But before dying, I prayed to God, asking him to allow me to speak to those whom I wish well, and he heard me. How long did it take for you to recover your mental lucidity, if you ever did? Eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have asked Elsie. I should have got someone else. Um, eight hours. God, I repeat, has given me the proof of his goodness. He deemed me more worthy than I actually am, and I could never thank him as I should. Are you sure that you are no longer in this world? If so, can you prove it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> whoops, whoops, whoops. You are in this world. <laughs> I am. In okay, I am absolutely no longer in this world, but I will always be close to you in order to protect and uphold you as you claim the charity and self-denial that guided me, guided my life. In the case of the next one, I will teach the true faith, the spirit is faith, that must uplift the beliefs of the just and the good. And he goes on to say, you would no longer recognize me, recognize me as that old individual in, invalid who had to avoid everything, to abandon every pleasure and happiness. I would very much like to speak to my children in order to teach them what they always showed themselves ill disposed to believe. How does seeing your body here affect you? My body, my poor miserable remains, must return to dust. But I'll always have a fond memory of all those who held me in esteem while incarnate. I look upon that poor decomposing flesh, the dwelling place for so many years, and I say, 
thank you, my poor old body. You have purified my spirit. My suffering has been a tenfold blessing and has earned me a well-deserved place. That is why I have been able to communicate with you so soon. Mm. Funny question, right? There we go. Did you retain awareness up to the last minute? Yes, my spirit returned its faculties. I no longer saw, I foresaw. My entire life unfolded within my memory, and my last remembrance, my dying request, was to be able to communicate with you as I am doing right now. Oops, you want a question, right? Yes. Uh, were you conscious the moment in which your body breathed its last? What happened to you at that time? What sensations did you feel? Life expires and sight, or rather the spirit sight, darkens. You find yourself in the void, the unknown. And then as if carried by an unknown prayer, you find yourself in a world where all is joy and wonder. Is that all you felt? Yes. Yeah. Do you know that... Um, what do you intend to say? What, what you intend to read in my burial? Oh, my friend, I'm, I apologize for interrupting. Don't I, interrupt me, please. I, but I already know, because I was with you yesterday when you wrote my epitaph. I'm very satisfied with it. Read it so you can understand me and they can appreciate you. I'm right here. Well, we, we were very pleased with the conversation we had the other day at your burial. If you are willing, we would be happy now to complete the subject for our instruction. I'm at your disposal. I feel happy because you were thinking of me. Since an erroneous idea about the invisible world is what so, uh, so often leads to disbelief, anything that might enlighten us concerning conditions there and which might enable us to comprehend that world better would be of great value. So don't be surprised at the questions we are about to ask. And I won't be surprised, and I'm waiting for your questions. Okay. Um, you have described your passage from life to death very clearly. You said that at the moment of, in which your body breathed its last, your life expired and your spirit sight darkened. Was that moment followed by any kind of painful sensation? Certainly. Because life is an incessant sequence of pain, and death is a complement to it all. A violent rupture occurs as though the spirit has to make a superhuman effort to escape its envelope. It is this effort that absorbs our whole being and renders, our unco renders us unconsciousness, unconscious of the transformations we are experiencing. Um, explanationary note. This is not the general rule. Experience has shown that many spirits do in fact lose consciousness before death, but among those that have arrived at a certain degree of spiritualization, the separation occurs without effort. Did you know that? I thank you for explaining that. I'm very okay. pleased about it. Oops. Okay, what impressed you the most? Oops, sorry, this is oh, yours. Um, I'm sorry, I'm stepping What on impressed you the most at the moment your eyes reopened to the light? I was dazzled at first. One's lucidity does not return all at once. When I recovered my faculties, I saw I was surrounded by many faithful friends. All the protective spirits were smiling around me, and an equal happiness animated them. I was able to travel through space. Wow. Under what appearance have spirits shown themselves to you? Under the human form? Yes, spirits retain their transitory form. What a difference there is between the crude apparatus that used to drag itself heavily under the weight of its trials and the wondrous fluidity of the spirit body. How do you see yourself? Do you have a head, torso, arms and legs? The spirit, of course, displays all these features. I feel my legs and toes perfectly well. Just now I squeezed my friend's hands, although they did not perceive it. What does that mean? No, it's my friend and oh. Andrea. <laughs> since it has been only a few days since you were a man in your new state, do you have a nature that is more male than female? Spirits do not have gender. You can open up. <laughs> <laughs> Under what appearance have spirits shown themselves to you? Under the human... Oh, sorry. Um, do individuals incarnate 
incarnates still look the same to you? Is everything as clear and distinct as it used to be? Much, much clearer, because I can now read everyone's thoughts. Mm. <laughs> would you explain how this transmission of thoughts works? <coughs> that would be impossible, since your faculties are limited. Mine? By matter. By matter. Everybody's. Patience. Oh. Become morally better, and you will comprehend everything. So, this is just a section from Can, Mr. Am I Samson. dismissed? You're dismissed, Mr. Mr. Samson, but I appreciate you. Okay, it was <laughs> awfully nice. Yeah. Good, good to have you here. You may go back to your, your incarnate body. <laughs> okay, so just to sum up, um, actually, before I, I, I go through some of the conclusions, there's another aspect that I, I didn't include, but I'd like to talk about <laughs> during Irma when. Fatchum and I were lifting everything off the floor thinking we were going to get surge up in North London Beach, which was ridiculous, but we, we started to and we started to realize how much clutter we have in our home. In fact, yesterday Fatchma started phase one. And after about every third thing she said, let's throw this away, let's give this to Goodwill. And I, well, you know, th there was that reluctance, that reluctance to give it up, right? And we all suffer from that, but we have to start. It's interesting looking at the the Western philosophy, particularly here in the United States where we have this, this box and we start putting things in the box and that box becomes too small and we get a bigger box. Yeah. And then sometimes we go out and rent boxes because we <laughs> can't get it all in, right? And you compare and contrast that with the Eastern philosophy, <coughs> which is start off A with a smaller box, but B they spend the whole life taking things out. You know, so that the passage becomes so much easier. That's number one. Second thing is about being pragmatic about death is to document it. I mean not just in terms of a will. But make clear what your intentions are. We had um, we have a very good neighbour, very close to, him, and she's in a she's over seventy. She lost her husband last year after forty plus years of marriage, and he's, he suffered a lot. But they made his passage much easier. She's very spiritualist, uh, very very spiritualist, and we talked a little bit about uh, spiritism in comparison with her belief system. Um, but when her husband passed away. He left a confusion of documents. It took us six months to try and work it all out and find out what was invested or what wasn't. But the one thing that they did discuss is that he made it very clear that when he was cremated, he didn't want anybody there. He just went, just get rid of this body, okay? What he did want was a commemoration of his life. And about a month, a month afterwards, we had a tremendous party, a kind of get together with all the friends and family. Um, we ate pizza and hamburgers and uh, always favorite food and we all said a little bit about what the person was and that's it's a commemoration of death we should look at death as something that is it's just like going somewhere else you know we're, we're changing address so the sooner we start that process the better okay so having said that I'm guilty of it I'm going to start and we're going to work on that so going back to the talk today I just like to summarize and try and give you a few of the points I'd like you to take home and, and reflect upon um, we can enjoy this corporal life, we should enjoy this corporal life, but we have to recognize what the pleasure are that are transient and, and what they are, for what they are. Remember, when a pleasure becomes a habit, it ceases to become a pleasure. And avoid, consequently, avoid overindulgence. We should be creative in our activities as well because boredom is one of the things that drags down our state of happiness. We should look for challenges, we should get out of our box. We should do a talk up here, which is very challenging. I can tell you. <laughs> but it's something you, you need to be able to write, Veronica, <laughs> your next month. Um, you need to get out of your box, right? And, and, and that brings new challenges and new enjoyments. And that, again, right is the spice of life. But again, let go of the material. Don't hang on to the material. I think there's a, a very illustrative point on this is um, when I look back, I, might, I love music. And I remember the first uh, gramophone player, I literally bought in the second hand store, an old wind up player with 78 records that had a lot of jazz, and I loved jazz from that moment on. But of course, that was superseded by singles and then EPs and then LPs and then digital, all that music source. But now, I have nothing. I have access to Spotify and I can get any music I want from this world. So, you know, that's, that illustrates the point. Don't be material. There is so much in this world that is not material. But taking that to the next level, we talked about well-being, so we're starting to go from expand our, our vision of happiness from just the moment to a more, trans, a more permanent state of being. 
We talked about resilience, the ability to overcome adversity, positive outlook, focusing our attention. And one of the things I've been doing since finally retired last year and I've got more time on my hands, I'm trying to get into meditation. I'm having a lot of difficulty, a lot of difficulty. But I can see there is an immense benefit to being able to meditate. Even only for five minutes a day. And I, I think I'm already beginning to sense a little bit of that. Um, there's a lot of guided meditation uh, materials out there which are very helpful for the newcomer like myself. And finally, generosity. Being kind to others. Compassion. Kindness. It's, that's, that's the key. And gratefulness. So when we look to the spiritist mindset, we have to look, take our vision from not just now, not just next week, next month, but in the next life. And the sooner we start to incorporate uh, that journey into our everyday life and our vision becomes extended, um, then we really start to increase our level of well-being. Again, mention gratitude, practice every step of the way, and seek true improvement. Not just today, tomorrow. It's continuous, okay? And hopefully I'm better than I was yesterday. Today I'll be a bit better. Tomorrow I'll be better still. And that process goes on and on and on. So again, it's a mindset, okay? From a spiritist point of view, we've got to look at life. This life here on Earth is, is a smith. It's a little tiny, tiny bit of the whole life of the spirit. So, how do we get there? One of the tools certainly is to read. Study, discuss, and apply the spirit. And probably the fourth word is the most important, the most challenging is to apply the spiritist teachings. Read those books, study those books, discuss them with others. It's a real help, okay? So, enjoy the journey. Um, so I'll hand it back to Andrea. Don't you want to have questions? Or? No, any questions? <laughs>